Our next speaker is an activist involved in the anti-vivisection campaign Gateway to Hell. John Roberts has been vegan and actively participating in the European animal rights movement for over 15 years, predominantly focusing his organi organizing efforts on the vivisection industry. In his presentation, John will introduce the Gateway to Hell campaign, share the history of the campaign's successes, and explain how a well-thought-out thought out strategy is slowly bringing the vivisection industry to its knees. So welcome, John Roberts. Yep, that's cool. Um, so thank you. Um, so let me just start by telling you, as, as I say, what is Gateway to Hell? Well, it was a bit of a struggle to actually figure this out myself. Are we a campaign? Are we a strategy? Or are we a movement? And I think, to be honest, we're a movement. But I now think of Gateway to Hell more of as a strategy than an actual movement, in that a lot of the activity that goes on around our strategy isn't being directly coordinated by Gateway to Hell anymore. Now that's great, we actually highly encourage that. It's not something we're bitter about, we really appreciate the fact that more people are engaging this strategy. But before I tell you about the Gateway to Hell strategy and what we do, first I want to talk to you about some relevant parts of the vivisection industry. I don't want to waste much time on it, I don't have very much time and I've got a lot of slides to get through, but there's certain elements about the vivisection industry which are relevant to what we do as a campaign and explain or will help you to understand why we do what we do in the way we do it. So the first thing that starts with, with vivisection in general, but especially the drug discovery process and the development of drugs, it starts with in vitro experimentation. That's um, experiments on cells in a test tube. Generally speaking, these are animal cells. And the main reason for that is because that the next stage is what's called in vivo, and that's animal experimentation itself. That's the classic animal experimentation that we expect to see. We see in videos, we see suffering of animals. If, if the compound in question passes through two stages of in vivo experimentation, if it passes through two stages, then it goes on to human clinical trials and potentially becomes a drug that becomes marketable and saleable. But the important thing that we want to focus on, really, is the in vivo experiments. So, in vivo research involves two stages, as I said. The first stage involves small animals, and this the second stage involves large animals. So, for the drug discovery process, they demand that it must be two mammalian animals, so two mammals, one that is non-rodent and one that is rodent. This means that the vivisection industry is quite blocked on certain types of animals and quite reliant on certain types of animals. So this is, this is quite relevant for where we'll come to later. And as I said, the leads, the promising leads that are developed in, in vivo then go into human clinical trials. So this is a very short view of the types of animals that are used in the various stages. But on the left-hand side, you can see that you've got the stage one, so mice, rats, guinea pigs, hamsters, gerbils fish, amphibians, birds, small animals. On the other side, you've got stage two, which is the second stage of experiments that will be formed for the same compound or same, same research. Maybe they're testing some, some reaction in the brain or whatever. So the second stage will then occur in primates, dogs, mini pigs, ferrets, cats, horses, farm animals, other large animals. Now, there's some requirements for animal research. Animal research is apparently scientific, and at least in theory should be a scientific study. So it's tied to certain scientific rigor. For example, all the animals used in the study should be the same weight, they should be the same size, they should be the same age, and ideally they should come from the same source, so that the animals being tested are similar. Now this is, this is particularly relevant, because it, it starts to make a bit of a logistics problem. Now, another thing I want to mention about the vivisection industry that doesn't get mentioned very often is interspecies differences. Now, when I say interspecies differences, what I mean is that animals from one part of the world, for example, primates from China, actually respond differently to the same chemicals as the same primates from India. This is extremely important because, again, this really plays into our strategy. So, there's been many examples. Not, it's, very, it's a very secretive thing, the vivisection industry, doesn't really like to talk about, but we'll, we'll come to this in more detail in a bit. So another thing about animal research, for these experiments to actually be valid, they need to be repeatable. 
That means they need to be able to get hold of the same type of animals that we used before. Failure to get hold of those animals and be able to perform experiments on them invalidates the previous research. This is another important part of our strategy. So, sources of research animals. Classic lab animal dealers like Charles River, Harlan, etc. Uh, pet suppliers, animal shelters, random source, that's more of a problem in the USA. That's class B dealers. They're essentially animals either from shelters or from bunching, which is pet theft. Now, one of the groups that we work with with the Gateway to Hell campaign called Last Chance for Animals has done a lot of work on this. So I suggest you look up, for, especially for random source and bunching, because Gateway to Hell isn't so much focused on this area. Now, one important fact about the animal research industry is that 99 times out of 100, the animals are not bred in the place that they're researched in. The animals are bred in one location. They're then transported to the location where they'll be tested on. And this is where our strategy comes in, because we take out the animal transporters. We take out the animal transporters, and this allows us to perform a two-pronged attack on the vivisection industry. Simultaneously, we attack the breeders and leave them with animals that they can no longer sell. Those animals aren't viable because they've got too old, they're too big, etc. And at the same time, we deprive the research laboratories of the animal victims that they would otherwise use. So we found this strategy to be highly, highly effective. But don't take my word for it. This is what the industry says. The situation is causing a big backlog. It's costing us money. Protesters have found a pressure point so effective that only one major airline still agrees to transport primates bound for research labs. Urgent and dramatic action is necessary. And every month they have a new conference, they have a new debate about what we're doing, about the problems of transporting laboratory animals. Each month, the scientific journals are reporting on this problem because it is squeezing the research industry massively. And as I discussed before, these interspecies differences, by targeting certain countries and certain supply routes, we can have a massively disproportionate effect on the research industry because these primates are coming from different locations and thus often respond differently to different compounds. So, for example, we have the island of Mauritius in Africa, uh, it responds very differently to primates from Vietnam and Southeast Asia. These are the same long-tailed macaques that you see used in most research experiments, but actually these geographic differences in where the animals grew up, lived, developed and were bred are having a massive impact on the actual, on the way they respond to substances. Now this shouldn't be a surprise because we've known for a long time that different human beings from different geographical regions also respond differently to different compounds, to the same compounds. We also know that males and females respond differently to the same compounds. So, realistically, animal research is bound by certain constraints, for example, the requirements for specific types of animals, the requirements to validate that research and repeat it, the, the need to actually get the animals that they need when they need them, if the animals get too old, for example. So this has started to cause complete chaos in the vivisection industry. They are getting very, very upset about our actions, which is a good thing because we're an anti-vivisection campaign and if we're not upsetting the vivisection industry, then we're not doing it right. So I, I want to move on to our first campaign, or the first campaign that I ran with Gateway to Hell, which was in 2008 in a country called Nepal, which you can see is trapped between India and China. Now, as we discussed earlier, different animals from different regions, or different primates especially, respond differently to different chemicals and compounds, etc. So what they found was that Indian-type rhesus macaque monkeys respond differently to Chinese-type rhesus macaque monkeys. Now, this caused the vivisection industry a bit of a headache, because in the early 1980s, both India and Bangladesh banned the export of primates for the research industry after exposés on horrific weapons testing, etc. This led the research industry, over the last 20 years, the supply of what they called Indian-type rhesus macaques became severely degraded. It became degraded to such a point that the breeding colonies in the United States were starting to get deformities, etc. So they, they started this new plan. Where can we get Indian-type rhesus macaques to refill our colonies? Well, they went to Nepal. And as you can see, if you see the border with China, you see the white lines. That's the Himalayan mountains. And that's what leads to the species difference. These monkeys have never made it across the other side and thus have slowly developed separately. 
So what happened was the American government or the National Institute of Health, which is essentially an American government agency, funded multiple American universities to establish breeding farms inside Nepal in order to get a supply of these Indian type rhesus macaques. So, once we realised the significance and the relevance of this, of this campaign, it became our primary focus. And the reason it became our primary focus was this was the last source of Indian type rhesus macaques. For the last 40 to 50 years before that, research had predominantly been done on Indian monkeys. So the results they were getting from China, which is a newly developed market and started in around 2000, started exporting a lot, a lot of animals, they started to find they were getting these differences. So the, you, the Southwest Foundation for Biomedical Research, which is a Texas-based research laboratory, is a huge primate facility, set up a, a primate farm. And they trapped about 400 monkeys in Nepal. And there's some pictures of the farm there. The, the pictures are a bit low res, but hopefully gives you an idea of the place. There was actually, in total, there were five permits that were delivered to various research authorities. Uh, they all paid, obviously. But only one farm was actually established in Nepal. And the idea was, let's see if we can get some monkeys out of there first, because Nepal is a highly underdeveloped country. There was massive corruption at the time these farms were set up. There was also huge political instability. However, they did begin successfully breeding monkeys at this primate farm. We received a contact from a Dutch journalist who was already working on the campaign in Nepal. Um, and she basically wanted help to escalate the campaign. And if you want to escalate a campaign, bring it to Gateway to Hell, because we will definitely escalate that for you. So indeed, there was a lot of protests. I think over a year there was about 60 protests, 13 cities, 8 countries, something like that anyway. There was constant pressure on the Nepalese government, constant protests outside. But more fundamentally, we were also doing a lot of cyber activity. And this is, uh, this is a particularly funny thing one of our activists did, was they managed to get into the guest book of the Forestry Nepal uh, government website. And what they did is they left 300 messages for each and every member of the Forestry Nepal website from a little monkey, you see Malish there, asking them to intervene. But of course, that was, that was the tip of what we did in Nepal. What we did in Nepal, a country which... Is, was barely connected back in 2008 when we ran this campaign, barely connected to the internet. So this was something we really exploited because the main, the main people who were actually using the internet in Nepal at that time were trekking agencies, hotels, tourism related. Normal Nepalese people simply weren't using the internet. It would be companies. So we also put an enormous amount of pressure on these companies and said, so we'd start cyber campaigns. We're not, I'm not coming to Nepal because of this. And if you don't like it, contact the tourism minister, which caused an avalanche of complaints to the tourism minister and, again, panic in the government. But I think my favourite protest from the entire Nepal campaign is this one. This is on the top of Mount Everest. That's the summit of Mount Everest. As far as I know, aside from the campaign to, to save Nepal's monkeys, there's only ever been a protest on top of Mount Everest to free Tibet. And after a lot of effort and a lot of stress and a lot of struggling and annoying ambassadors across Europe, we closed the monkey farm and all the monkeys were released back into the wild. That was our, that was our first great success as the, the Gateway to Hell campaign. In the end, unfortunately, there was uh, some duplicity and a bit of confusion. We, we actually arranged with a Dutch primate protection group to travel to Nepal and help with the rehabilitation. Um, now, that didn't go down too well because we'd also been working with the government at the time to ensure that the animal breeders wouldn't receive any compensation for their efforts. So, the outcome of that was that the animal breeders decided to take the animals to the forest and dump them. So they literally took 400 monkeys to a forest and dumped them out. Many of the juveniles, we believe about 50% of the juveniles that were born into captivity died as a result of this. However, the population is still strong and many of the juveniles and babies that were actually born in the Kwam are now actually living in the wild. So, we moved on to our next campaign. 
after the success of after the success of Nepal, we were contacted by Israeli activists who were campaigning against Mazor Farm, which was a which is a breeding facility in Israel. They they asked us, how do you think we should deal with this? And obviously we said, well, let's take out the transporters. So we looked into who the transporters were, and the transporter was the Israeli national airline, El Al. Now, El Al are incredibly sensitive. El Al have genuinely faced a terrorist threat from, from well, a terrorist threat for, <laughs> for, for years, for, since the 1970s. So the idea of having animal rights activists targeting them caused panic. So after one protest outside their office in Copenhagen, incidentally, their offices are not marked and have bomb-proof doors and windows. The, the one protest and the threat of more actions caused El Al to immediately place a ban on the transportation of all laboratory animals. The Mazor Farm and various other uh, related facilities, uh, they, they made complaints, they, they pushed, they shoved, but earlier this year the final legal case was won and El Al no longer transport animals. So another, another really successful campaign that we, we ran, this was actually organised mainly by UK activists who were based on the ground there. In 2010, following the successes against El Al and the success in Nepal, we, we realised that maybe, maybe we can actually close down the UK entirely. The, UK, the United Kingdom's an island. They have to bring the animals in somehow. They can't just drive them in. So campaigns were launched, there was a campaign group called NAVA, there was Little Brown Dog, various other campaign groups, and they targeted ground handlers at airports, they targeted the ferry companies, they targeted everybody related to the transportation of lab animals. This caused such a crisis in the UK that the British government threatened to use the military in order to transport lab animals. The science minister at the time, David Willits, is on quote, quoted as saying, it would be a shame if the military had to, resume, to take up the transport of animals. Now, anybody who's familiar with the UK will know that the UK government has a history of complicity with animal experimentation. They bailed out hunting and life sciences multiple times. So I'm happy to say the British government are not transporting lab animals because if they were, it would be cheaper for the vivisectors. So, this is one of the few times where we actually looked at a campaign and thought, oh shit, we did too well. But the, the figures speak for themselves. As you can see, from 2010, there's a drop from over 4,500 experiments on primates to 2,500 in 2011, and that's now only recovered to 3,500. This is because they, are, they simply cannot get the animals into the country. So we actually believe that many of these experiments, certainly in the, in the 2011 and 2012 period, would have been repeat experiments on animals they already had in captivity rather than new animals. We believe now that they have opened the gateway to an extent and that the UK is now more accessible for, for research animals, but it's still something we're working on. So the next campaigns we moved on to, we started working with a group called South Florida Smash HLS. They're a very militant organisation, they do lots of home protests, they love to get in people's faces. So they were our perfect comrades. So what we decided, we, we actually started working on a plan to take out the Caribbean islands of St Kitts and Nevis and Barbados, both of which supply the vet monkeys, mainly used in research for drug dependency and alcohol research. Um, Actually, the, the, the Vivet monkeys in St. Kitts steal alcohol from the beaches. They're a tourist attraction. So these, these little monkeys that steal alcohol from tourists and that make everybody happy secretly are then snatched from the beach and shipped to US research laboratories. So, in total, so from the south, from, from that region flying animals into the US from, from the Caribbean and from South America, we, we had seven airlines in total, uh, cargo carriers and uh, passenger carrying airlines, for example, Tamlin AS Arias, Caribbean Airlines, Suriname Airlines. They, they're, all, they're all passenger carrying airlines, whereas Amerijet, IBC, uh, Choice Airways and Monarch are all cargo carriers. However, they were 
the only transporters from the Caribbean and South America. None of them are transporting anymore. So we now know that they're actually transporting the primates from St. Kitts and Nevis and Barbados on ships. They're transporting them on cargo ships because they simply cannot transport them by air. Now, if you, if you see the size of the, the Caribbean Sea that we're looking at here, that's kind of viable. We, we're probably talking a 24-hour boat journey. So we figured, how do we now escalate this? Where, where do we go? And we figured, well, they can't fly them across the Pacific. Well, they can't ship them by boat across the Pacific. So let's move our attentions there. Oh, no, sorry. <laughs> so what we did is we, we launched the Air France KLM campaign, which I will talk about more later because it's still an ongoing campaign. But essentially, Air, we, we told Air France to stop. Air France told us there's no, we have no right to stop. And Air France were also insisting a lot of other things, but I'll, I'll talk more about the Air France later. The main thing that this slide is here to illustrate is the fact that we established Air Sous France which was the first major French cam uh, anti-vivisection campaign group to actually try and organise an international campaign. And for quite a while, Air, Air Sous France was actually in the lead of the Air France KLM campaign. However, we, we actually took it back under the control of Gateway to Hell because the challenges of translating. If we would produce everything in French and then translate that to English, it slowed us down. Whereas if we could publish in English and then translate into other languages, that speeded up our... That speeded up our processes. So, what we, we found ourselves a bit stuck with Air France. We, Air France wouldn't move. Air France still won't move. Air France will move, but Air France hasn't moved yet. So, we started to figure, what are we going to do to keep our momentum going? So, we had this brilliant idea. Strategy of isolation. If you won't stop, you'll be the only one. And as a result of that, everybody will target you. And that's exactly what's happened. We started the strategy of isolation in 2012, and we concluded it in 2014 with the victory over China Southern Airlines in March, leaving Air France KLM as the sole transporter of, or sole passenger carrying airline that transports primates for the research industry. This involved taking out seven major airlines, mostly across the Pacific campaign and the Pacific route, which I'll talk about now. So the Pacific Supply Route is, it links Southeast Asia and China across the Pacific to North America. Now I'll, I'll show you a map so you'll be able to see it a bit clearer on the next slides. But essentially over the last years up to 20,000 primates a year were being shipped from Southeast Asia, for example Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, uh, Myanmar, Philippines, Indonesia, China. We've managed to significantly reduce this, although we're not certain on the statistics yet, because taking out China Southern happened in March, so we won't get the statistics till the end of the year. But this is the Pacific Supply Route in 2012. You have, you have to forgive the, the crude lines, but essentially you can see that on the left-hand side you have Southeast Asia and the where the animal supplying nations, and on the right-hand side you have the USA and the the research laboratories. So we took out as part of the, the Pacific, Pacific Route campaign, which also bled into the strategy of isolation because there was only one airline that wasn't supplying that route. So we took out United Airlines, Philippine Airlines, Vietnam Airlines, China Southern Airlines, China e Eastern Airlines, Air China, Hainan, and there's another one that's missing off the bottom. But anyway, we took out a significant number of airlines and Today, the Pacific route looks like this. There's only one company transporting on the Pacific route. They're a member of the Air Transport Services Group. They're a cargo transporter. Now, what they're doing is they, they can't fly over the Pacific Ocean in one hop. They can't reach. So what they do is they fly up the globe to Alaska. They fly to the Arctic, where they refuel the planes and fly them back down south into Houston. Now, we know these to be the only transporters, and worse than that, we now have information that in October of last year, on one of their first flights from Cambodia, 25 animals had to be euthanized on arrival. They, the animals were found to be very weak and very thirsty, very weak, hungry, and thirsty. 
This is a result of poor management on a plane that's not designed to transport animals and transporting animals from a tropical location to the Arctic and then back to a subtropical, not a tropical location, but certainly Texas is a very hot, dry location. We wouldn't enjoy that ourselves. These animals, they're totally ill-equipped for it. So we're expecting more and more deaths on ABX air services until we can put a stop to this. However, we're not letting them get away with it. And this is, this is an important fact. ABX air, over half of all their custom comes from DHL. They fly planes with DHL livery. They use their own aircraft with their own ABX air markings to fly DHL parcels. As far as Gateway to Hell is concerned, ABX Air and DHL are one and the same. Whilst ABX Air are transporting animals for the research industry, whilst animals are dying on their planes, we will hold DHL accountable. We've had DHL in talks for the last two months. I've been privately discussing with them a lot. They've already asked ABX Air to stop, but quietly they told ABX Air, if the protests die down, we'll let it go. Well, unfortunately for DHL, we have now linked these deaths, which is actually, this is the first time I'm speaking about this publicly. We will be writing a report on it in the next few days, but this is a conference exclusive that 25 animals died as a result of ABX Air and DHL's complicity. So the campaign is now going to really start to spike against DHL. DHL is a major cargo company. They're all over the world, but unluckily for them, they're a German company, and Germany is one of our strongest regions. So they, they can expect a lot of problems. We, we will enter more negotiations with DHL next week and hopefully squeeze them to squeeze ABX without having to go to the whole hassle of a huge campaign, other websites, etc., etc. Um, yeah, just anecdotally speaking, it's quite frustrating when you set up a whole website, print leaflets, and then win the campaign before you get to distribute them. It's <laughs> so, but it, this, this was a protest against DHL in Hamburg at the, at the airport in Hamburg where there's also regular protests against Air France. And also, this was a protest against DHL in London. This is uh, another recent protest. But we, we're now expecting the DHL campaign to, to spike quite significantly over the next months. So, whilst we won't be letting Air France off the hook, we, we need to focus on closing the Pacific route. Not just, for, not just for the animals that are suffering on ABX Air's aircraft, which are totally ill-equipped, but to cripple the primate research industry in the USA. One of, the, one of their responses that I should mention is a massive increase in the development of primate farms and primate breeding in the United States as a response to this campaign and our activities. However, primate facilities and primate breeding facilities still need fresh animals to replenish their stocks. So we will keep pushing against them and we will, we will force this issue. So, on to the airline that everybody loves to hate. So we're three years into the Air France KLM campaign now and I'm sorry to say we really still don't have much progress, at least externally. However, the, there's been some quite significant developments internally inside Air France. Quite aside from the fact that Air France is losing hundreds of millions of euros every year, aside from the fact that their 2015 recovery plan has failed dramatically and they're shedding more staff, they still refuse to stop transporting primates for the research industry. And this, this represents a challenge because these are the routes that Air France flies. So if you, if you see, you, you essentially see the, on the middle right, you can see the whole Southeast Asian nations, uh, China, Philippines, India, Indonesia, Laos, Vietnam, Cambodia, etc., etc. Air France are transporting animals from all of those regions to Paris. You'll also notice in the bottom left, there's a route going up from Africa. That's the island of Mauritius. That's an island that exports 10,000 primates per year, and that's an island that is now only served by Air France KLM. 
Now, again, as we discussed the interspecies differences, the colony in Mauritius has been isolated for over 400 years. We can expect that removing Mauritian primates from the primate research market will invalidate yet more research for, these, for the researchers. However, as you can see, the gateways remain open. And even if we do close the Pacific route, the animals will just fly via Paris at the moment and then fly to the USA that way. They will fly them all the way around the world if they have to, but they need those animals. But this makes Air France absolutely essential for us to take out. The research industry constantly writes them letters thanking them, and Air France uh, uses this in their statements, that the research industry thanks us for our efforts, etc. But once we take out Air France, we will genuinely see a collapse in the primate research industry entirely. We, in, in some cases, we've already doubled the price of a primate, which, as, as you'll be aware from the stage two research, basically, for stage two research, it's dogs or primates. It's dogs if you want to poison them, primates if you want to experiment on them for human research. So by attacking the primate research industry in the way that we are, we're actually also attacking the wider vivisection industry and actually preventing experiments on mice. However, the Air France campaign, when we launched this campaign in 2011, we were in agreement that this campaign was to demand that Air France stops transporting all lab animals. A lot of the campaigns we've run since have been around primates, but Air France are responsible for transporting an enormous amount of other animals as well. They actually specialise in transporting animals. So, on the one hand, where Air France could be considered better than ABX Air because their aircraft are better equipped, etc., they're also worse in the amount of animals that they're actually transporting. And realistically, if we're honest with ourselves, it's much better to die in transit than it is to make it to a research laboratory and then spend years being poisoned, prodded, manipulated. So, the, aside from there the not actually being much, much movement from Air France, there is actually a lot of movement from us. For example, this, this is a protest last weekend in Frankfurt. This was a march of about 600 people marching against Air France. And if you see on the building, I'm not sure if you'll be able to see it, there's a little golden crest and a Vietnam Airlines. So I actually chose this picture because the march was passing Vietnam Airlines, which is a previous target of ours. I find it quite ironic. This is another protest, um, protests in Hamburg again this time at the airports. Uh, this was a banner drop in Berlin during the, the previous week of action. This was a die-in that followed the banner drop, I believe, where the, the activists literally just dropped and created a scene. This was a protest in Prague in the Czech Republic against Air France. This, this is probably one of my favourite actions. This, again, is uh, our friends from Los, uh, Last Chance for Animals that I talked about earlier. This is a billboard at Times Square. Uh, it's not there now, but it was there for months. At Times Square in New York, there was literally millions of people passing it every day, and it was two or three blocks around the corner from the Air France American headquarters. So they, they knew it was there. And this is another one. You really cannot see the scale of this. This, this is enormous. This, this is across an entire freeway, a six-lane freeway, going to Los Angeles Airport. So I forget the entire dimensions, but the, there is actually a video of the contractors putting it up, and they look like little ants along the top. Uh, protest in France. This one, I think, was in Lyon. This is... yeah. I almost forgot this. I should have probably moved this further up the slide deck. So this is a protest in, in the USA. And an important fact about the USA is that in the USA, Delta Airlines represents Air France KLM. So if you're associated, you're guilty. So we're now running a campaign in the USA against Delta Airlines. And obviously, Delta, having recently implemented a policy themselves, are now deeply upset to be targeted again. And this is one, one last image of protests 
in, and this one was in the UK, I think. Yeah, that was in Birmingham, uh, Birmingham Airport. So a few things that I just want to say before we move to questions, because I, I hope you're going to have questions and hopefully I'm going to be able to answer them for you. Ways to support the campaign. The campaign, I, I just wrote this really quickly. Do the obvious, don't fly with airlines that support the research industry, don't support companies that do. I mean, we don't anyway. Organize or join protests in your area. If that's the one thing you can do, do that. We don't need your money, we need your time, we need your protests, we need you to be annoying, we need you to frustrate them. If you can't join a protest, if you can't organize a protest, participate in the email and phone actions. Email and telephone actions, especially telephone actions, have proven time and again to bring down these companies. Some of these airlines we've taken out, we've taken them out with only phone actions. We haven't done a single protest. There's, a, there's also a lot of confusion about phone actions. A lot of people are uncomfortable picking up the telephone or they think they can get into trouble. You are allowed to call someone up and tell them you're not happy with them. And if all of us do, even if you speak to them and you stutter and you're confused and you're scared, as long as they know why you're bringing them, you're the 400th time they've picked up the phone today. They already know the story. It's just, oh, it's another one. <laughs> So really, 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 phone and email actions, support these actions, they're absolutely vital. They, they're one of the most effective things we do. And finally, if you do want to make a donation, our German campaign group, who organise our, our German language network, have a stall in the, the stalls area down there. They're called Stop Vivisection. I didn't actually have time to profile them, but they're, they're an awesome group. They're, they're organizing 40 or 45 German local animal rights groups. So constant, constant, constant actions. So if you, if, or, or we do actually have Air France representatives as well. So if you want to make a donation to the French campaign, they're also awesome. Um, things I just want to say finally, if anybody's going to be in Marseille on the 20th of September, there's a, there's a major march that's going to be occurring against Air France um, in collaboration with Air Sous France and Alarm, who are a group in Marseille. And our next, our next actual week of action will be Primate Liberation Week, which will be the 11th to 19th of October, where we will be mobilising against the primate transportation industry. We're working closely with Stop Animal Experimentation now, who are the organisers. Um, again, I didn't really have time, so I didn't mention them, but they are well worth checking out. They're one of the best organised investigative US groups, and they, they assist Gateway to Hell massively. So, questions, thoughts, or opinions, anybody? Yeah, I got it. Ten minutes, right? Okay. Cool. Um, I'm not sure. Maybe it's a question you've been asked before many times, but um, I guess it's not very obvious for everyone, for for the for the clients, that uh, ABX and DHL, for example, is the same company. And there are many, many things that you mentioned, as a as if you knew them, like a matter of fact, that uh, the airlines fly this route or another another route. I guess this all involves a lot of. Uh, delicate information gathering and I just yeah. wondered how you do that and whether you have your in people inside the companies and stuff <laughs> Yes, I, I don't want to say too much about our sources, which is why I didn't mention them before um, We often know what's going on with shipments before the head, head of the management do we We're actually the one of the reasons that airlines don't resume is because we find out now there's there's various sources for that there's there's public information there's public research you can do but we also have numerous reliable sources who provide us information both from major campaign groups that don't officially want to share information but from people working for them who know that we should know this and also from people inside the industry often um yeah people inside the industry i i better not say any more than that so I don't want to compromise our sources. But yes, we have excellent sources of information that we've built up over years. Um, 
When we're talking about sources, just I should mention this. If you're ever cultivating sources, you have to build trust. You have to be consistent, you have to build trust. We've built trust with our sources. They trust us, they know that we won't drop them in it, and they're so quick to give us information now. Anybody else? Yeah, no problem. It's all right, I'll, I'll repeat it. Yeah, uh, so uh, the lady asked about Air India. That's, Air, Air India is a really interesting one for us. We actually started a campaign against Air India because what, what actually happened with Air India is they, they implemented a policy to ban animal transportation, but what actually happened was the price just went up three time, uh, 300%. But India is a very corrupt country like that. So we believe that Air India is currently transporting nationally but we don't believe they're transporting internationally. So we would definitely like to get more involved with Air India. Uh, we do actually have them listed as a target still, but at the moment our information is, is very limited because of it, it being just national, national transports. Um, I know that Air India did actually think they'd stopped. They, they genuinely at the top level said, no, we're not having anything to do with this. But unfortunately at a lower level, people just took bribes and it carried on regardless. Um, I don't know if you've seen it, there was actually a Nature magazine article about Air India. Uh, it's, it's worth looking up, there was, um, there was a Nature magazine, Nature's a major scientific journal. They, they published an article about, about the um, transports, about the ban, and also that people at the research industries have said, yeah, no, we're still getting our animals, they just cost 300% more now. So, yeah. To answer the question, Air India is a complicated one for us. It's definitely something we have an interest in, but... Oh, they, they, they often do. You see... One of, the, one of the fundamentals with what we do here is this is one of the, uh, targeting the airlines is one of the few places where we can actually make genuine public opinion count against the industry because we can contact consumers that have nothing to do with the industry but who are opposed to animal experimentation and we can use them to apply leverage to companies that again have very little to do with the research industry, have very little to gain from it and the threat of the, the public relations disaster of being seen to be associated with it is such that we, we call it a force multiplier. As in, we, it's like a pressure point. Rather than pushing here, it's like pushing in the armpit. The same amount of force has a much bigger impact. So I'd, I'd like to talk to you more about if there's groups in India that we can communicate with. Because we, we can also help with things like negotiations and stuff. We've got a lot of experience. And also leveraging them where, they, where they, they'll understand that actually we know what we're doing, we've done this many times, we have our sources and we, we can find out if you're lying. So, yeah, let's have a talk about that afterwards. Yeah. Positive. Yeah. Has anybody else got any other questions? Uh, back first then. Yes, hello. Um, I was just wondering if all the animals that are being transported, do, are there research permits for every animal or are there some that are possibly going from illegal wildlife trade into private hands or is there any research on this? Okay, so in theory, every primate certainly should have what's called a CITES certificate, um, Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species. 
basically it needs to be authorised. They're, they're kept in what's Appendix 2, which means they're threatened with extinction, but they're not that threatened. So, in theory, every, every animal, every primate, should be transported with a CITES certificate. We know in reality that this generally isn't the case. And when you look at CITES data, you often find that one side is reporting this many, but the other side say, no, we'll say, say we, one side says we exported 300. The other side says, yeah, we imported 4,000. So there's, there's always a major disparity, and CITES is very weak. Um, but yes, generally, there's a paper trail for monkeys, which is one of the reasons that's, that's one of the reasons we leverage monkeys. Because not only do they, they cause issues with the stage two research, it also, there's a paper trail. However, I'm currently investigating a, a Delta Airlines incident where Ameri uh, sorry, African wild rats, the Tanzania banned the export of these animals because they become endangered. So the researchers went to an exotic pet supplier who had a reputation for being able to get any kind of animal you want. So they, they shipped them via Delta with no CITES certificates and the animals died in transit, which is how we know about it. So, yes, the sources for vivisection animals are very murky. Vivisectors, they like to pretend that they don't know and they like to put uh, maybe a Class B dealer between them and the, and the criminals, but often the source of research animals is criminal. Um, less so in Europe, more so in less developed countries, I guess, but yeah, it's, it's a bit of both. So, so do you have any figures about how, what the percentages of what, how many are being transported without a CITES certification? No, because there's no certifications. Well, yeah. I mean, it's, it, we, I could speculate. Okay. Um, and how do they get through? Like, how, what, what's okay, the procedure so of getting I tell, through? I tell you, I can, here's a good example I can give you. The, there's the Lao Cambodia Vietnam Triangle. And essentially, that's a monkey laundering industry where monkeys born, bred here, were then moved to Vietnam, or monkeys captured in the wild in Cambodia are then sneaked into Vietnam into a farm and then given a certificate to say, yes, they were bred in the farm in, in Vietnam. So we know that, I would say, 10,000 or more a year just in that triangle. But then actually coming to the research labs, usually the laundering and the faking of the certificate happens in, in one of the, the distributing company, countries. So it's, there's, no, there's no clear figures, but it definitely happens, and it happens quite a lot. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks. You're welcome. And I also have a shorty, because um, Gateway to Hell is mostly about airline transport, but of course everyone knows that they are transported to depots and then transported in another way. And you've already said about DHL, but they are also curious on TNT and FedEx. And of course animals are also transported between facilities. Will Gateway to Hell try to also target those companies and this kind of transport? Yeah. Yes, we will, definitely. We, we've targeted a lot of cargo transports already. Um, the, I think it was UPS made a statement that was extracted. Most of the actual cargo companies themselves don't transport animals. Um, so most of the major carriers, like DHL has a policy not to transport animals, like lab animals at all. So it's not actually being done on, it's not being done on DHL planes, it's being done on ABX airplanes. But because ABX Air and DHL have that sort of relationship, we're just leveraging that. Whether DHL is really responsible or not, that's kind of secondary to the fact that we want ATSG and ABX Air to stop. So we do a bit of propagandizing sometimes. So be warned, DHL. But it's good. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, one more question, really quick. Yeah, you can just repeat it. So I'm from the United States, and I have friends and volunteer for Sing. Awesome, yeah. And also, So, well, an interesting story about the, the question is whether there's more flight routes for ABX that we don't know about. Um, I actually flew into Amsterdam a few weeks ago and saw an ABX air aircraft parked up outside the DHL 
cargo facility. So what that tells me is that ABX Air flies to Amsterdam. Uh, more than that, I can't really speculate, but it, it wouldn't be on the beyond the realms of possibility for them to fly to Southeast Asia, then back to Amsterdam. However, at the moment with the European, the European trade is mainly covered by Air France. So at the moment, there's less transporters on that route. But I'm, I'm glad, um, I didn't actually mention um, the, the questioner actually mentioned our, our American network and the work they've been doing against ATSG, so I should mention the Bunny Alliance as well. Those guys are awesome. <laughs>